for general context, folks should know that we're here at Langton Shores, where I am a resident in skilled care and receiving hospice services through Optage Hospice. We see our gifts in almost a monolithic way. And so we sometimes mute our ability to discern. And if we're muting our ability to discern, we're missing maybe uh, the essentials of what God has for us. For example, this flower pot behind us. Um, it's not looking so good right now. I'm starting to, starting to need some tender loving care, but um, when it was when it came as a gift to me, the buds were so tight with each other that I could not tell that they were not tulips. So I thanked the person who brought them for the bouquet of tulips. It was my daughter's in-laws, so I could very easily go back and, and we could have a chuckle. But the point is, every one of those blooms opened up into a different flower. And it was the same bouquet I received as a gift, but I didn't receive it in the fullness of its beauty as it opened up. And I think God works with us in that similar way. He uh, has a gift for us. And we need to stay engaged with him and with his enlargement of our participation. And so there are blooms that are opening for us that we have been prepared for. And we may not know that. In fact, we probably don't know that. And, and so it becomes essential when we talk about uh, give, being gifted, recognizing that this is not monolithic. This is God working in his creation with you and me. I know for me, <clears throat> I never expected that. I never expected the offer. I never expected the opportunity to engage in a ministry that I had been told I was called for since I was 12. To be able to do something like this without it being in a con congregation or parish setting, and to come alongside people in healthcare uh, where I had the bulk of my experiences before. And so to be able to do that um, was more than a privilege, it was a calling. So the idea of the expansiveness of what God was giving me to do, especially at the end, or what I perceived is as the end of a career. So to put that in the terms of now not just being called um, in a specific way for specific use at the Deerfield, the Mayfield, and, and Echo Ridge. But to put that now in the context of receiving this call and having to put it in the perspective of what I offer or what God can do through me as I lie here in a hospital bed on hospice because some of us might think we're done and I know there's so much need here with the staff I get to touch every day with the prayers I get to offer for the residents that I continue to know for all of you and for us as a group and for the senior management crew and Dan and the leadership that they provide and with such generosity. And that was the other word that when I think about my relationship to Press Home in the context of my ministry, Press Homes has always operated in my experiences 
out of a most generous spirit in some very difficult situations. And uh, I am proud to be part of our, our crew and to serve even in my hospital bed here, uh, Presbyterian Homes and Services. So we never stop serving. And, and I guess I should say that I'm not just here as a pastor. Um, I'm here as a servant. And I think our orientation through, throughout Fres Homes is one of service. And we're here as servants. And for me, it has developed over a period of 18 years that I've been with the organization now. So it's been great fun, it's been a great adventure. I'll be honest, I, um, when I had to move away from the position at the Deerfield and Echo Ridge and Mayfield, I started hearing, oh, you've touched so many lives, Fred. Huh? Really? Because I always felt the one that was blessed. I always felt I was the one who was being ministered to and had an opportunity to be vulnerable with others in their vulnerability. And, uh, it never was an occurrence to me of how many people I, I just, it's still not an occurrence to me. Um, although they can keep the cards and letters coming. So, um, that fulfillment and being able to be received by others as someone who's trusted, and I'll use the word love, you know. And uh, we probably all have had people bring us down to their cheek and give us a kiss and thank us and say, I love you. Uh, and we get to say, I love you back. You are amazing. You're an amazing creation of God who loves you more and more and more. And uh, I appreciate that he's letting me know you. Something like that, you know, that comes from the heart at the time. Our role is to help people know that they're loved and to uh, to be able to share out of the goodness of God's grace to us how much he loved us that he would die on the cross for us. I had an experience when I first started at the Deerfield, so 10 years ago, never forget it. There was a guy that we were getting a, an admission of a gentleman from the hospital didn't know much about it. He came and and uh, so I easily walked into his room and and introduced myself. He was a crusty guy. What I learned is that he was picked up by the police uh, in one of the culverts in our county and brought to the hospital. He's telling me about how hard his life has been and how nobody cares and, you know. And uh, one simple thing, I'll use a name, but it's not his. <laughs> Tom, I want you to know God loves you. God loves you, Tom. And then with tears in his eyes, <clears throat> that bring tear to my own eyes. Tom looked back at me and he said, I sure in hell hope so. And it was one of the more spiritual uh, encounters 
in that brevity of that response that I've had. He was able to be genuine. He wasn't pretentious. He had nothing. He had nothing to be pretentious about except uh, the fact that he was the loneliness of the lonely. Uh, or the, did I say that right? Maybe not. At any rate, friends, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about who you're sitting across from. Who's in the bed that you're kneeling next to? When you talk about relationships and support, and who needs support when? You gotta be available. You gotta be accessible. You gotta be out and about. Um, and interested. And that speaks of genuineness. So those were attributes I always tried to emulate. Most of it comes natural. I think that's part of the calling. Things that you had to work at before maybe aren't as hard to do these days. You have more of a sense of yourself and the confidence in the call. And, uh, you know, you're there to serve. You're there to serve the rest, you know. Um, opportunities to serve at a staff member's grandma's funeral. I have no right to do that, except that the resident or the, the staff person herself trusted me to do that. And, uh, or baptisms or, or weddings. Do you think at all I ever expected in long-term care uh, chaplaincy to marry two of our staff, not together, but to have two weddings? Or in those same families to baptize six different children? I mean, you can't make this stuff up. You know, you can't. You're brought into the family. And that's the case whether it's staff or whether it's resident. Um, people need to know you and to trust you, to let you on that journey with them. So, could I sit and cry or sit and sing or just sit? Yep. Yeah. yeah, God's ministry of presence is a bloom that's opening up for all of us. So we can relax. I mean, the worst thing is feeling like you're so on that your gifts are being evaluated and you can't, you can't be fully in God's call for for the circumstances. So I, I felt extremely fulfilled. Um, when I would receive a hug coming in the room, when somebody in the bed would reach out their hand to hold mine, um, it was no longer about anything except their circumstances and what they were feeling or dealing with. And that takes time. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about who you're sitting across from. Who's in the bed that you're kneeling next to. And not whether or not you're an expert to bring them something that they need that they wouldn't have without you. But in your genuine sense of calling, to be giving thanks for this person's life and to reiterate to them what I was reiterating to Tom. Tom, God loves you. He really loves you, Tom. And for me, that was been the essence of the entire experience I've had at the 
the Deerfield, the Mayfield. All of those folks have become family to me. Um, Bible study wasn't just Bible study. This was an opportunity to meet with other members of the family. Um, we had a coffee group at the Mayfield, 20 people at a time, and it would rotate in and out based on when people got up from bed. That's family, you know. Um, and the invitation to be part of family Uh, that is something that uh, we're called to be family.